shepherd, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. You know, when you think about, as we heard this morning, you think about who Jesus was. Jesus was God. And you know, when you think of the plan that was in the heart of God to work out this great plan of salvation, do you think that ultimately it would end in, it would end in a people unsatisfied and not fulfilled through the, word, through, the, through, the, through the work that Jesus would do? Why do sometimes we look so unfulfilled and unsatisfied with the work that God has done for us? Why? You know, we, you, know, you know, see, as Christians, you know something? We should be ever so conscious of giving a wrong view of what God has done for us. We should be so conscious of that. That's our responsibility to show this world. Yes, we won't always be shouting hallelujah. Yes, but you know something? We should be an overcoming people. You know, the first statement Jesus said is, uh, in verse 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. You'll say, sometimes you see people, they don't need to say anything to you. You know, you can just think of that scripture. He came to steal. He came to steal our joy. He eh? came to steal our joy. You know, the devil wants to steal our joy. He wants to steal everything that God has done for us. Try and take it away. Oh, when you get to eternity, obviously not that can't happen. But he'll try and do it this side of eternity. He'll start, try and take away your testimony. He'll try and steal everything that Christ has done for you. You know what? You've got to fight for it. You've got to fight for it. We've all got to fight for it. That means we, that, that doesn't mean we, we can save ourselves. But you know what? You have to fight for your joy. You have to fight for your victory in, in Christ. You know who you've got to fight? <laughs> your flesh. Because your flesh does not want to give any glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Your flesh is your enemy. You might say, oh no, the world's my... No, no. The greatest enemy is your flesh and my flesh. But Jesus Christ came to overcome the world, the flesh and the devil. So that we'll be a victorious people. He said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Tell me something. What's happened to all the life? What's happened to all that life? What's happened to all that resurrection, overcoming, supernatural, anointed life that Jesus Christ came to give the Christian church? Because that's the, Christ, that's the church that Jesus died for. He came that we might have life, you know. See when the, see when the word of God is being preached, Right? When the word of God is being preached and you are as dead as a tombstone, you know what? You don't have that life. You know why? Because your flesh is dictating to you right now. That's your life. But when you feel the spirit moving within you, the joy of the Lord that's your strength, you feel that reality. You know that there's something in you that's greater than this world. There's something within you that, that overcomes the depressions, overcomes all the different things that comes your way. That's that life. And we have to display it and exercise it more and more in our Christian walk. Because sometimes we can let these things pull us down. You know, there's nothing more discouraging at times <laughs> when, when sometimes Christian, Christians come in and say, oh, I've had a difficult week. Of a this, of a that, of a dinner, of a this. So what did you what, what what did you do for it? Did you not did you not come to Christ? Did you not come before Christ and say, Lord, give me a quick give me your quickening spirit? That's why he's there, that's why the Holy Spirit's there. To give us life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life. Because see if you don't have that life, the word of God means nothing to you. You can come into the church. You can go out of the church. If you don't have anything of that life exercised within you tonight, nothing I will say or can ever say will be a blessing to you. You know that? As the past late pastor used to say, 
There's no point in me bringing all this stuff to a congregation that's overcome by the flesh all the time. I want to preach to somebody who's got life. And then it can be reciprocated back. <laughs> and he used to always use, use a, like a tennis match or a, you know, somebody returns. And that's, that's what the pastor looked for. That's what any speaker looks for. Just somebody to smile. Somebody says, I know what you're talking about. I know where you're coming from. I know, I know what you're talking about. And that's it. Whenever, whenever, whenever you're preaching and you just get this blank look, you're saying, oh Lord, give me life. Give me some life. Don't you want that? I'm sure you want that from me. We all want that from each other. Give us that life. Tell me something. See if you've got Christ in you tonight, you've got that life in you. But for some reason or other, sometimes we allow it to be overcome by things of this world. That life's in every one of us if we're born again Christians tonight. That's what happens. When, that's what happens when your Christ comes out and my Christ comes out or Jack's Christ or John's Christ or who, and that's when you share Christ. And you know what? That's a beautiful time. That's a beautiful time. That's why Jesus came, that we might have life and might have it more abundantly. If you look to last time, I've been looking at this uh, across it on the word shepherd and I've only got to the third letter only got to the third letter in the past couple of times I've tried to get through this and I'm still not I'm still not going to just I just want to say something very quickly on sonship to you before I pass on whenever someone says to you in the world well I've seen on I've seen you believe in sonship humanity so tell me what when does sonship humanity begin if it didn't begin in eternity, when did it actually begin? And give me scripture for when it actually began. What, could, what would you say to them? What, what scripture would you take them to to show them exactly when his sonship humanity began? Think, of, think about that for a moment. What scripture would you use to say, this is when Jesus, who was God, his sonship began now. I'll just give you a couple of verses. Over in Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49. You know, we're a church that believes in the true sonship that the, the word of God brings. You know, this is a Jewish word. This is a Jewish word. There's the Gentile version of this, the Christendom version of this is that it was an eternal sonship. But when you go back to what the Jewish word says, it says here in Isaiah 49, Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, ye people from afar. The Lord hath called me from the womb. There it's there. That's when his sonship began, from the womb. Not in eternity, it began from the womb. From the womb of his mother. I'll give you another scripture. I've mentioned this to you often. The reason I say these things to you because, you know, our pastor, late, late pastor, laboured many, many years seeking to teach us all of these things. Don't let them fall. Don't let them fall. Don't realize that when the, when the, when God gave a pastor the ability to look at these things and fight it was to it was to, it was to give a, a people knowledge and understanding of these things it also says here in, in psalm 22 this is a messianic psalm speaking of the lord jesus christ what does it say here read it from verse 8 he trusted on the lord this, these were the these were the verses that were used in matthew 27 when those around the cross looked upon Jesus and said, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from, from the womb. Remember, from the womb. If anybody asks you when his sonship began, 
in the womb of his mother. That's when the sonship, humanity of Jesus Christ began. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. As we heard this morning, Jesus was God. How can he say now that he's got a God? What, is he a, was he a lesser God? No. He only had a God when he took a sonship in humanity in the womb of his mother. His sonship began in the womb of his mother and he only had a God from his mother's belly because he was God. Anybody ask you when his sonship began, what will you say? In the womb of his mother. Don't forget these things because people will ask you sometimes. What does it say over in? It says in Isaiah 49, The Lord hath called me from the womb, the bowels, from the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. When did he make mention of his name? From his, from his mother's womb. You go to Matthew chapter 1. And what does it say? She shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He wasn't Jesus. He was God. But he was called Jesus from his mother's womb. It's all in the scriptures. It's all there for us to see. And not only was he, his name called Jesus, what else does it say who he was? Verse 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. That's his deity. Emmanuel, God with us. When was all that declared? of who he was from the womb of his mother. And if, in Luke chapter 1, it says again, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. His name was called Jesus from his mother's womb, not in eternity. He was God in eternity. It all started in the womb of his mother. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father David. I know this doesn't mention womb here, but in Romans chapter 1, what does Paul say of this, these great truths? Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. You know, that's what you've been separated unto, you know that? Even you are brought to Zion Baptist Church. You know, you're separated into the gospel of God. Not the gospel according to men, which will bring an inferior sonship and will bring the and will undermine the person of Jesus Christ. No, no. When you were brought to Zion Baptist Church, you were brought to the gospel of God. Brothers and sisters, that's special. That's so special. Don't let these don't ever think, oh. We've only got a few here, but we've only got this. No, no. I don't know about you, but I feel special being part of this church. I know I'm a son of God. I know I belong to heaven, but I feel special being part of being brought under a ministry that was sent from God. We have been separated unto the gospel of God. You know what that means? Gee, when you get the gospel of God right, there won't be any errors in it. You won't be peddling heresy or untruths because it's straight from the word of God. He goes on to say, which he had promised afore by his prophets and the holy scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. So, how was the son of God to do with his, with his deity when it says here he was made according to the seed of David? There's nothing, there's, where people get all these things from, I don't know. Concerning this son, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. His sonship, brothers and sisters, was in his flesh. And after the seed of David. And declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness. We heard that this morning from John. By the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations 
for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's ministry, Paul's gospel, the gospel that says, Paul says, my gospel was the gospel of God. And that's the gospel you've heard. You know, you're a privileged people. We're all privileged people, brothers and sisters. Because you know, you've heard the truth. And the truth shall make you free. That's what the Word of God says. The truth shall make you free. You know, we, we, some times people say, you know, it'll set you free, it'll set you free. But something that's been set free can be brought into captivity again. But see, when you've been made free, you can't be brought into bondage again. You shouldn't be brought into bondage because if you're made free, you're made to be free. You're not made for a situation of bondage. An oppression, you're made to be free in the truth of God. And I just say these things in passing. Anybody ask you when sunny sonship? Here it's here. From the womb of his mother. That's when his sonship began. Not in eternity. Gary will come across this when he's doing his studies, and there's the scriptures there. Gary can say, There's there. There's what I believe. There's when his sonship started. From the womb of his mother. He was called from the womb. They were my God from my mother's belly. Everything happened. His sonship began from the womb of his mother. Not in an eternal setting, in, a heaven, in an earthly setting, from, from his mother's womb. And uh, uh, we looked at, I'm not going to go any further on that, we looked at his humanity. We looked at how he was the son of David, son of Abraham. And ultimately, why he came, why he took humanity, Hebrews 2 and 9, and he took on flesh very quickly. You see, I mentioned all these scriptures to you. I'm not going to dwell on them. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, by bringing many sons to glory. Verse 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. You see, all of these things are there to encourage us and to inform us. Not just, you know, if I, see if I didn't have this Bible tonight, I could tell you these scriptures. I don't, as, it's, as such, I know these scriptures. Get to know the Word of God, because you know what? It's no longer now in there. It's now in your heart. It's now inside you, through the power of the Holy Spirit. I know these scriptures because I've looked at them hundreds of times. As John said, he listens to the Word of God. You know why? Because John's hungry to know the Word of God more. But surely John, after being in the, in the faith for 50 odd years, whatever it is, 60 years, surely he would know it. No. You can never become over familiar with the Word of God thinking we know it. There's always something new. For the Lord to reveal to us. And you know what? Never be happy till you've got these truths in your heart. Because it's when you've got them in your heart. That's when you know them. You can't know them unless they're in your heart. If you say, I come to a church and I hear that preach from the... Oh, that's, that's good. But are they in your heart? Do you know that for yourself? What do you think the disciples and the apostles did? They didn't walk about with Bibles? No. It was in their hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the only way to know that is to look at the Word and to pray over it and say, Lord, I've heard all about this sonship, this truth of who I am as a bride, who I am as a child of God, who, who I am, uh, what my identity is. Oh, Lord, that I might know it more, that I might know your purpose for my life. Paul says that in Philippians, that I might know him. What are you talking about, Paul? Of course you know him. You've been preaching him all over Asia. What are you talking about? That I might know him and the power of his resurrection. Paul wanted to know him. And he wanted to know him more and more and more and more. And that's that hunger that God puts in your heart. God creates a hunger within us, brothers and sisters, 
for us to know these things. And we looked at his humanity. You know, I was, I was getting a real blessing when I was looking at Isaiah 49 this week. Because in Isaiah 49, it tells you about the whole purpose of the Lord. I'm just going to look at a, a few of these verses in Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49, this is our pro prophecy, prophecy concerning the coming of the Lord God's servant. It says, Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, ye people, from afar. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. He hath made my mouth like a sharp sword, and in the shadow of his hand hath he hid me. That's why, that's why we can preach the gospel in the open air. We can tell people about Jesus. But you know something? He's got to be revealed. God has hidden him in his hand. He's the hidden wisdom of God. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me. And it's only when we get a revelation of him do we really understand and really know what God is showing us. When we get a revelation of these things, says it over and you know this brothers and sisters you know all these verses what does it say what does it say in first corinthians chapter 2 it says that god has ordained something beautiful for his people it says here how be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect yet not the wisdom of this world nor of the princes of this world that come to nothing you see Today we've got people in this world who think they're so intelligent, they're so knowledgeable that, oh, Christianity, they're fools. These Christians are fools. You know what the Bible says about them? It says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to, become, be, to be wise, they have become fools. This world today is a world that is displaying this rejection of God and the wisdom of God, and it's being revealed all over the nations of this world. When they see we are now wise, we've moved on from that. We've moved on from that, these, this historic thing about God. Christianity and all the rest of it. We've moved on. We're wiser than the, these, these Christians lived way back in 2,000 years ago. We've moved on. You can be whatever you want to be now. It says, what have they done? Professing themselves to be wise, they become fools and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image make, made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts. You can see the downgrade, don't you? You can see the downgrade of this nation. Nations all over the world when they're adopting this new age era. This new age, this new, this new wisdom, as it were, of this world. Bringing all these new thoughts in. We don't need to obey God's word. We are free now. We've broken the shackles of all that long ago. We don't need that. Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lusts one toward another, Men with men working that which is unseemly. Homosexuality, lesbianism, all this other stuff. What does it say? God gave them up to a reprobate mind. That's what you're seeing all over this world today. You know what? Think of the depravity of all of that that's taking place, right? John was challenging us this morning. What our attitude is towards God and what he's done for us. Think of the darkness in that. And think of yourselves tonight. God's revealed to you the gospel of God. 
He's not left you to your own thinking. He's not left you and give you up to a reprobate mind. No, no. Paul says, we have the mind of Christ. What a gulf God has brought between us and the world, brothers and sisters. God's been so good to us. He says he gave him up. What's a reprobate mind? A mind that no longer works properly. Can no longer reason things out properly. No longer thinks the way that God had designed the mind to think. Everything's all turned upside down today. You can be what you want to be. You can change your sex. You can do whatever you want. You don't need to be male or female. You can, even they get confused with their so many hundred different identities and all the rest of it. Wow. And you know something? It's all born out of something very simple. You know what it is? A lie. The mystery of iniquity is born, is, is, its foundation is on a lie, is on a deception. And that's what you're seeing being worked out all over this world. But God has separated us unto truth. You see, these people think they're being free, but they're just part of the mystery of iniquity. All they're doing is getting deeper and deeper into the depths of depravity. But you, brothers and sisters of God, you're a ch child of God tonight. God has separated you unto the gospel of God and made you sons of God, an identity that you could never bring yourself into, but that God has given you as sons of God and a bride of Christ. All of these things, all of these things, brothers and sisters, we're seeing happening all over the world today. You know, it's very simple. Anybody ever says to you about transgenderism, homeless, you know, all these sort of things. You know something, brothers and sisters? You know what it is, don't you? It's just a lie. They're deceiving themselves into thinking they're something that they're not. All these different things that we are happening and has been accepted today and is being placarded everywhere you look. If you don't accept this, you're in big trouble. And you know something? It'll come to this church. You know something, brothers and sisters? I believe that we are, on a, we are on a path, this whole nation, this whole world is on a path, a, a collision with God, Jack often says. That doesn't mean to say that God's not going to send revival amidst all of that. God can send revival amidst all of that. Absolutely. Because he's going to elect people. But you can see it all coming. You can see it all happening. It's all coming in like a flood. You know, you need to be strong. You need to be strong. You need, to, you need to put on the whole armor of God and be strong in this day. This is a difficult day. This is a day when, you, when there's powers of darkness out there working against you as a child of God. That's why Jesus Christ is praying for you right now. He came to shepherd these people and to show these people that he cares for them. You know, it goes through this and tells us many things. It says, and he made me a polished shaft in his quiver hath he hid me. That's, that's, the quiver is that thing that holds the arrows. You've heard of that before, haven't you? He's a polished. You, can, you, can you just see? You know what that is? That's a picture of God sitting, polishing his arrow, polishing his, his weapon. He's polishing it, making sure it's all ready for battle. Is that what you do in prayer? You prepare yourself. For God to use you when God brings you to the church for prayer. Do you sit and prepare yourself? Do you prepare yourself in any way? Do you come in? You know, I'll, I'll tell you something. Very, very, a very basic thing, right? A very basic and a very simple thing. Do you know something? See, no matter how I feel when I come into the church of God, right? No matter how I feel, do you know something? I know I'm a child of God. And you know something? See, when I dwell on that and I think about that, I'll say, out the road, flesh. Get out the road. I'm here for God. No matter how I feel, I know there's something inside me that's greater than my flesh. And it's a very simple thing. It's not something that you need to work at. It's just an attitude of mind. No, no. No, no. If I'm a child of God... And greater is he that's in me. Well, I can overcome this anyway. I can overcome this darkness. I can overcome 
whatever feelings I'm feeling right now through the power that worketh mightily within me. It's a very simple thing. You don't need to work at it. It's just a matter of, no, no, Satan, you're a liar. At the, at what I'm saying, I'm saying this to you tonight because you know something? Christianity at times can be an attitude. Oh, no. If I, if I believe who I am as a child of God, you know what? Well, God has made me more than conqueror through Christ. And see, if you take these things on board, you know something? Think depressions won't get you down. Difficulties, yes, yes, at times we all get down. But it will never keep you down. It will never stop you from being who, who God wants you to be. You see, you know yourself at times. We can let things get us down. Let things overcome us. But see just one thought of Christ in you, the hope of glory. No, no. No, no. It sometimes just takes one thought to, for you to open the door to one thought and all of a sudden you're finished. You're not, you're not going to do anything for the Lord. You're not going to, you're not going to pray. You're, you're not going to do anything. But uh, if you shut that door and go like that, no, no, Satan, you're a liar. Satan's power is in his lies. It's when we believe the lies, then we allow the lies to come in and overwhelm us and overcome us. The mystery of iniquity is based on a lie, a deception from the devil. But Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's a very simple thing. Very, very simple, but so powerful in your Christian life. You know, I was looking the last time in Matthew chapter 14, and I, I brought you to, uh, it was Matthew 14 and verse 13, and I was looking at how when Jesus was ministering, uh, through, uh, when he began his ministry, people began to follow him. And when he said to the disciples, come and follow me, James and Andrew, remember? Over in Matthew chapter 4, it says, And Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee, verse 18, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of me. And straightway they left their nets and followed him. And it goes on, going forth, he saw two other brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother. And what did he say? The fact mending it, and he called them. And they immediately left their, their ships and, and their father and followed him. And ultimately, you'll see this right through the word of God. In verse two, and there followed him great multitudes of people of Galilee, from Decapolis and from Jerusalem, from Judea and from beyond Jordan. People were following Jesus. That's what Jesus says. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Sometimes we see people making professions of faith. And all of a sudden, a few months down the line, a year down the line, they're not following Jesus anymore. What happened to my sheep hear my voice? But here's a beautiful passage in Matthew 14. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place. And when the people, this is after John the Baptist had been uh, decapitated, uh, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. And Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. Jesus' ministry was to come to call, his, to call people, and ultimately, not to, to, to preach the word of God. And ultimately, in preaching the word of God, they would follow him. And that's exactly what happened. Sheep, people were following Jesus Christ. They were following. There was multitudes following him. And as I said the last time, they weren't worrying about, oh, where's he going? You know, is he going up that mountain? Where, where's he going? Oh, it's getting, getting, getting quite late, you know. We'll need, to, we'll need to start thinking about our dinner. What are we going to eat? What are we going to... You know, what about the kids? What about this? What about that? No, they weren't thinking that at all. It just says they left everything. They left their houses, left their dwellings, and they followed Jesus. 
It says, uh, it goes on to say, and when, the evening, and when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place and the time is now past. You know, when, that, when this a whole idea of the time is now past, what you'll see is, what really, what really the writer's trying to get at is something is taking place. The time is now past. Remember, Jesus, you even used that over in Mark. I'll give you this, Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 and verse 15. This is the Lord Jesus. This is, I'll read it from verse 12. And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. This is the Lord. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan. Uh, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. Now, after that John was put in prison, this is the same time, remember? This is just after John was put in prison. John was beheaded. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom, saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Why is he saying that? The time is fulfilled. You know something, brothers and sisters? See, ideally, when you come into this house of God, you know what you have to do? You have to leave time behind. You say, yeah, but how do you do that, you know? How do you leave time behind? When you come into the house of God, brothers and sisters, if you're in the Spirit, you know what? You're not worrying about the time. Because the Spirit is eternal. When you come into the house of God, time has to depart because you're now in a different realm. You're now in the kingdom. You're now, you're now entered into the kingdom through your spirit. You see, it's not like coming and sitting down in, a, sitting down in one of these seats. No, no. When you come into the house of God and you're in the spirit, you know what? You're beyond time. That's, that's what this is all pointing to. Now the time has passed. Send the multitude away. They may go into the village. They weren't thinking about food. They weren't thinking about They weren't saying, oh, when are we getting something to eat? Like the Israelites in the, in the wilderness. Oh, come on, we're starving. You've led us out here. What's going on? Where's the bread? Where's the water? Where, 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 where's it all? You know, they're not like that. Because they were in the flesh. You know something? These people were following Jesus. And they weren't getting caught up with their fleshy desires, because they were moving. They were listening to the voice of Jesus, and Jesus was leading them out, leading them out into the wilderness. It says, And Jesus said unto them, They need not depart, give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. And he said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves. And that's when I come in at this next point in my acrostic for P for pastures, green pastures. And that's exactly where Jesus was leading his people. You see, that's what the word of God says. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Remember? Leadeth me in pastures of grass, or tender grass. This is all happening here in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's leading them out. He's the shepherd. He's the good shepherd. And it says, bring them here. And he commanded the multitude to sit down in the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes. Looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave unto them uh, and, his, and his disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled, and they took up the fragments that remained, twelve baskets full. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. You know, it says there was twelve baskets full. And you know something, brothers and sisters, Jesus even speaks about this. Jesus even speaks about this over in Matthew chapter 16. Remember when he's talking about the leaving of the Pharisees? You know, there's a reason why Jesus says these things to the disciples. Remember what he says? Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaving of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It's because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread, bought no bread? Do ye not understand, neither remember, the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? 
neither the seven loaves of the 4,000, how many baskets you took. There was a relevance for these, for, for these figures. There was a relevance. There was, Jesus was saying, there's, there's a reason for this. How is it that you do not understand that I speak it not to you concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You see, what's happening here in Matthew 14, ultimately, is the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know why he's come? Why did, what did he say? Why he's come? Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 6. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people. This is Mark 6 and verse uh, 34. And was moved with compassion toward them. This is the same account over in Mark's gospel. And it says, he was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. This is the same passage recounted over in Mark. Why do you think there was, why do you think there was five loaves? And why do you think there was 12 baskets left over? You see, in the Old Testament, the Jews were all caught up with the Torah. That was, that was their meat, that was their bread, that was everything to them. They, they supposedly tried to live by this. They thought this was everything. The five books, the Torah. You know something? Jesus is the new Torah. You know what John says in John's Gospel? The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Jesus would take the Torah, as it were, the five loaves, and he would multiply it. He would make it exceedingly abundantly. And they were all filled. Why? Because Jesus did it in the power of the Spirit. Jesus was able to take, as it were, the five, the, the, the five loaves, the five loaves that he was given. But it, sp it spoke of the Old Testament Torah. That's what the people all, the Pharisees and all the rest of them all get caught up with. But Jesus came to do something new, to show them. He even says, the Word of God speaks of me, the Torah speaks of me, the Deuteronomy, Exodus all speaks of me. And when He came, He came to fulfill it. So when He fed them with the five loaves, what was left? Twelve baskets! Jesus' ministry will never fail. The Word of God will never fail. Why? Because there was 12 baskets left over. Who's that? The Israel of God. Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd, will, bring, will, will open up the Word of God. He will bring the, the Torah, as it were, and He will preach it to His people. And you know something? His people will hear it. And at the end of it, He's come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You see, first of all, he's, he's ministering to the Jews. But then in the next feeding, as the shepherd, who's he feeding? You go over to the, you go over to the next passage when he feeds the 4,000. Who's he feeding there? And by the way, something happens in between us. Remember, he meets the Gentile woman. And Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. And he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and sought him. And he said, send, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. Uh, but he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It's not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And Jesus said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. And then it says, Jesus departed from thence and came unto, us, unto the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there. You see, why did he, why did he, why, why does it say he came up now into a mountain and sat down there? Because that ties up with the Word of God. 
It says, remember, remember God's promise to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 19. It says, the law will come out of Zion. The law, the salvation of God will come out of Zion. The law will come out of Zion. You see, speaking of the new covenant, speaking of the new, the new testament, speaking of the new testament in his blood. And it goes on to say, then Jesus called his disciples and said, unto, and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat and I will not send them away fasting. There you go. Imagine coming to the church. I'm finishing a few minutes. Imagine coming to the church. <laughs> Come on. Be honest. How many is it the last three days? Three days. Three days what? What was, what was happening? Jesus was ministering. Jesus was preaching the word to them. Three days? Three days without food? Oh, no. We, we need not do it. Burger King. We need not do No, there was none of that. Jesus' ministry was satisfying them. Jesus' ministry was blessing them. That's why they stayed three days. They couldn't, they couldn't be get torn away from them. And you know something, brothers and sisters? See, when you touch Jerusalem above, you know something? You won't want anything to try and tear you away from it. Because when, you, when you're touching Jerusalem above, forget everything else. There's no comparison. I mean, Jesus came. He ministered from this mountain situation. And his disciples said unto him, When shall we have so much bread as in the wilderness as to fill a great multitude? And Jesus saith unto them, how many loaves have you? And he said, seven. And a few little fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took bread. He took the seven loaves and the fishes and gave thanks and break them and gave to his disciples. You see what Jesus is doing here? As the good shepherd, Jesus is taking the mystery of Israel, God's mystery people, Israel, and he's bringing them together. He's bringing the wisdom of the Old Testament, the Hokmah of the Old Testament, and he's bringing the Sophia of the New Testament. See, everything is fulfilled in Christ. Everything, he brings everything together. It goes on to say here, and, he, and uh, they did all eat and were filled and took up the broken meat that was left, seven baskets. Why? Why seven baskets? Why in the first account was there 12 baskets after Jesus had ministered to his people? Why now seven baskets? Because what's the seven? It's the mystery among the Gentiles. Christ in you. The hope of glory. And Jesus brings these two great ideas together. The Israel of God, the Israel people, the 12 tribes, and he brings the, the Gentiles and his shepherd. And first he says, I have, I have other, people, other sheep which are not of this fold. Then they must come. They must come into the fold, into this fold of Israel. Remember, he says that in John. When you see the ministry of the Lord Jesus, you start to see that Jesus was doing all of this. Maybe not always understood. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. See all this nonsense about Israel being separate, having a separate time for, for the Jews to be brought in. No, no, Jesus is the good shepherd to the Jew and the Gentile. He brings in them both the mystery. That's why Paul in Romans 11 says, this is a great mystery. Remember? And he goes on to say in Romans 11, I'll just read this, read this to you. See, people are getting confused with this whole idea of Israel. Why was Israel cast off? Why did this happen? Why did that happen? And Paul's trying to, you know, there was a, big, there was a great revolt. Even, even amongst the people of God in Rome. In Rome. And uh, that's why, um, who was it? I think I've got it in my Bible here. <clears throat> it says that 
Claudius, I think it was, uh, cast out about 40,000 of the Jews, of the Christians, because there was so much tumult going on in Rome at the time. That's why when, when you go to Acts chapter uh, 16, I think it is, 18, when Paul meets Priscilla and Aquila, they've just come from Rome. And they tell him of, of the tumult and all the things that's been happening. That's why Paul writes the, road, the, the letter to Rome. And he's trying to quell all, all, this, all these different things that's going on. Because there's all sorts of dissension. There's all sorts of things going on between the people of God. And Paul's trying to bring all that to a conclusion and to show them that God has a purpose in all of this. This great mystery has found its destiny in Jesus Christ. And ultimately... Uh, Paul brings all this out and he says, For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature. See, they were, they were forgetting. Sometimes we forget. We're brought in because of grace. Through faith in the Lord Jesus. We're not anything special than anyone else. We've been chosen by the Lord to be brought into this. But sometimes we lose it and think, Oh no, we're better than this one. We're, 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 we're the people of God. You're, you're just, you, you, you're, the Jews have been cast off. They're the branches that have been removed. Paul says, no, remember, you're only part of the, the olive tree because of grace, because of God's grace. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so Israel, all Israel, shall be saved. As it is written, they shall come out of Zion, the deliverer, Israel was never going to be saved under the old covenant. What does Zion speak of? The new covenant. The covenant in Christ's blood. The new covenant. It's all to do with Zion. It's all coming out of Zion. And they shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them while I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as teaching, as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Why? Because they were God's foreknown people. That's why. Because Paul starts off by saying, as God cast off his people which he foreknew, you, God will never cast off his people which he foreknew. you. Because it's all these foreknown people that he's going to save. It's only natural Israel that's been cast off. It's only natural. And you know something? You'll never understand this fully if you come in here as a natural man or woman. None of us will. You've got to come in here in the Spirit. You want to grow in grace in this church? You know something? Come in in the Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to move afresh in your life. And you know something? God will transform your life. God will not just bring you to Zion Baptist Church. God will take you to Jerusalem above, which is free. No, no, but you, that's where I want to go. That's what I want to touch. Because you know something? You only really know it when you touch there. Then you've got a first-hand experience of it. <laughs> that it's real. And it's not some pie in the sky when you die. You see, Jesus has raised us up. God has raised us up and made us to sit in heavenly places with him. What, is, what does that mean? What does it mean to be raised up? And sit in heavenly places. Well, as Jesus is sitting there overcoming, overcame all the problems and difficulties that he had to be our saviour, when you're sitting with him, guess what? You've now got overcoming power in your life as a Christian. And that's a sign that you're with Christ. <laughs> that you're sitting with Christ in the heavenly place. How? That you're an overcomer. <laughs> and you're not overcome. That's what it is to be raised up with Christ. That's the whole purpose of him coming as the good shepherd to bring us to the pastures, green pastures. You know what it says in Ezekiel? He'll bring them to the high mountains of Israel. Do you want to be, part, do you want to be ministered to in the high mountains of Israel? You can't do it unless you're in the spirit because you've got to ascend to get up the high mountain. And you'll only ascend if the Holy Spirit takes you up. The Holy Spirit lifts you up and takes you up away from this time, space, world. What did Paul say? When I received the revelation of Jesus Christ, I conferred not with flesh and blood. Yeah. I pray, I know these things are a challenge. 
I know these things are challenged, but I know this, brothers and sisters, you know what? I want New Testament Christianity. Don't you? In conclusion, let's sing 968. <laughs>